Good morning, Ali. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm very well. Thank you for uh, having me this morning. Absolutely. I think that you guys are the new warriors. And and what you guys do uh, in journalism is is mind-blowing. I don't think any other generation has had to deal with what you have got to do with. And I mean, and you've got to show up on time. And and you guys are well, just the I new warriors. That, I love being appreciated. Thank you for that. To get up every morning though, and and to face a wall of just constant change. I mean, and then and then you've got to report it. Yeah, that is the one part, and I appreciate you pointing it out, that's tough for us because there isn't a break from it. And, you know, there are days I'd love to be uh, MSNBC's sort of fun things reporter, but <laughs> between politics and war and hurricanes and tornadoes and shootings, which is kind of what I do, uh, it's it's a lot sometimes. It's a lot for the mind. You have to go out there and remind yourself that actually people are good and kind and there are more of them than not. So was writing the book a uh, good therapy for you so you could release some steam and then this way you can get back to it? Well, it does help to actually read it so you're not caught up in the vitriol, right? One of the problems about news coverage and polarization these days is that everybody's got an opinion on everything. Mm -hmm. And my go-to over the years has been to understand the facts of a matter to read it. So I was the guy who, when Obamacare came out, I read the entire document. Um, not sure that's for everybody, but it really is for me. It helps me understand this is what's actually in it. This is what we're debating. The problem with today is that most people get their information about these things through commentators, whether mm -hmm. it's on radio or in print or on cable TV. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of these commentators are brilliant and I rely upon them. But I think for things that are really important, that are central to our actual democracy, putting your own eyes on it, difficult though that may be sometimes, is probably the better answer. Oh my God, the challenge to get it right, only to have the competition say that you got it wrong. I, 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 don't, know, I, don't, yeah. I, I don't know how you get your heart involved in that. Well, the, the, the point is to get it right, right? To, to actually think about it, make sure you're doing the research to, to feel that you are as accurate as you can be. The accusations are going to come anyway. But, you know, just yesterday was a perfect example. There was a judgment in New York about Donald Trump. Yep. It was a civil judgment in the, in the Letitia James case, the attorney general's case against him. And we knew that it had come out, but it was a legal document. And I had a conversation in the commercial break with my executive producer and we were working through it and we don't speak enough legal to have gotten it right. And he said, I'm getting you some lawyers. We're having some people read through it. I've got the reporter on the story, but they're reading through it. No one's ready to go on air with this yet. What do you want to do? And I said, then don't. I said, let's get it right, not not be first. Uh, if, we, if we avoid being first, let's get it right. By the time we went on to it with the reporters, with the lawyers, we were ready and the story was accurate and I'm prepared to stand up to it. But that's the world in which we live. You wing nothing anymore. You guess about nothing anymore. When it comes to legal documents like this book that I published, you just get it right. You think it through. You make it accessible to people and you help them come to their own decisions based on the truth broadcasters as well as journalists go through that moment where it's like wait a second i know that i jumped the gun mine was when the soviet union fell i hurried up to get it on the air but i didn't have the information that was the stupidest thing i had ever done because listeners didn't know and i sounded like i didn't know did you ever have a moment like that was like stop we've we've got to patiently make our way through this i, I mean i've had i've had uh cases where we've talked about people who were killed who weren't killed people who died who didn't mm. die um, you know, in the end, uh, it was not consequential because nobody actually died, but it's consequential because somebody's faith in you dies a little bit, right? Because the whole the whole reason to listen to you or to me is to trust us, That's to it. believe we've done our homework, to understand that we don't wing it, we don't get it wrong. And look, in cable news, it's hard because it's constantly unfolding stuff and people want to see it. They want to see, we've got video of a campus and apparently there's a gunman, a, an active shooter out there. We've got all sorts of stuff, but we don't actually have information mm. the fact that you've got a camera on something or a helicopter above something doesn't mean you know what you're doing and the fighting the impulse to say more than you know is a remarkable one in this business but i i think that the the damage you can do with little mistakes that now plays and this didn't happen when i was in my early years that now plays into the see your fake news in the old days it used to be you just made a mistake and yeah. people would forgive you yeah. for it now it just underscores the fact that your people are all liars and you don't know what you're talking about so i'm triple careful about that kind of stuff now boy especially when you write a book like this sir i mean i mean you, you know yes. we are the divided states of america and people are gonna you know they, they're, they're gonna be coming at you from every direction 
And I, but I want them to read it. I would love right. for people to give this book to people who don't share their view on it because it's just the indictments and it's a foreword that I've written that that illustrates what the arguments are going to be on all sides, including the one that Donald Trump makes, that he's constantly being stifled and his First Amendment rights are being stifled. And I point out that in the first indictment that I put in the book, I put Jack Smith's uh, indictment first because it's sort of the most compelling reading. On, on page two of it, he says, Donald Trump has a First Amendment right to deny the outcome of the election. He has a First Amendment right to lie about it as well. And that's not what these charges are about. He's not being charged for lying. That you're, it's actually protected in American speech. What he's being charged with is affecting or trying to affect the outcome of that election in a way that was not lawful. And I think that's important. The distinctions are important for people to understand, no matter whose side you're on or where you fall on the political spectrum. And for people who do want to see Donald Trump convicted, I think it's important to understand what's in these documents, yeah. what's strong and what's not, and whether or not Donald Trump gets a fair trial by a jury of his peers. Because that we don't want to be one of those countries where people who are prominent get tried and the trial isn't fair and faster than it should be. It, it should play out the way it should play out. It feels like, especially these days, I mean, when, when the news broke yesterday about the former president, it was like, oh, OK. And you, you kind of roll your eyes going, we're getting numb to this. And it's like, are we supposed to be getting numb? We are not supposed to be getting numb. You can't be getting numb to it because it's really serious and it's really consequential. And you need to know the argument that you're supposed to have against people who are numb to it, number one. Yeah. Number two, there are a lot of people who are really worried about what effect this will have on our democracy. The fact that we've got a trial and we're very divided and we're very polarized. But there are so many examples of modern countries around the world who have prosecuted current and former presidents and prime ministers and ministers and political leaders and the studies indicate that in all of those cases, those countries came out stronger as democracies in the end because they followed the rule of law, because the justice system worked. And as a result, citizens of those countries gained greater fa uh, faith in their own democracies. That is what I would hope will happen. I'm not. I'm not telling you that's what's going to happen, but that's my hope. I would love to be a fly on the wall inside your studio today because I want to know what all these other people are asking you because, I mean, there's a billion questions here that, that just keep flying around because you, you're that guy. You're the closest thing we've got right now to getting the truth. And and basically what you're saying is it's here. I'm, I'm willing to share it with you. Grab yourself yes. a yellow highlighter and start reading. That's post-its, highlighters, pens, notes. That's the world in which I've, I've literally said, this is your roadmap. This is your guidebook. You're going to be watching this thing probably for the next two years, yeah. well beyond the next election. And you should know what it's about so that when you hear commentators and analysts and experts talking about it, you know what the underlying material is. And I will say this. Most of this book reads like a novel. The Manhattan, <laughs> you know, the Manhattan case is a little trickier because it's it's a it's ledgers and ledger entries and things like that. But it's it reads like a novel, a spy novel. Parts of it read like a like a novel you you wouldn't even believe if you were reading it. But read it. Just know it for yourself so that you can have an informed discussion about democracy, which is what is in trouble in America right now. I'm optimistic. I think democracy in America will prevail and will be fine. But just like it's your responsibility to vote and to register to vote, it is your responsibility to know the things upon which our democracy hinges. And in my opinion, these four cases, these 91 counts, are, upon, are, are the thing upon which democracy hinges in America. Ali, I got to ask you a personal question in the way that whether it's the trial in New York or down in Florida, what happens if the potential juror has read your book? Will it come up in that courtroom? Has anybody read this book? Because we want to make sure that da 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 da. Because you know how those those lawyers are; they like to break yes, you sir. down on that stand. Yeah, and and the, the the I would argue, and I would think that if somebody says they read the book, that causes them to be a good juror because this book is the unabridged. Uh, you know, the charges, they're there. They're just there. They're the very documents they can give. Now, one might argue that, hey, you're you're at the Mar-a-Lago case, but you've read the other three indictments. These are public documents. People yeah. should read things. We don't, obviously, but they are public documents. This is not some weird treatise on Donald Trump. I have my opinions on Donald Trump, but you'll hardly find them in this book. Yeah. Um, 
this book is literally meant to be a field guide to the to the cases against Donald Trump, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, regardless of who you plan to vote for in the next election or who you voted for in the last election. You know what's so odd about this is that we've lived this, and and you know it's I mean and and what how are we going to pass this forward to a generation ten or twenty years from now? They're going to say you what he did what? No, presidents yeah. don't do that, and yet yet we live this. Yes, and we're all amazed by it, but what we can pass on is this is how we dealt with it. Yeah. So it may be a couple of years before we can do that, but I would love to be able to say, and other countries have done this, to say we had this happen, and here is the fair and just way in which our system addressed it. I'm hoping that's the outcome. In fact, that's more important to me than guilt or innocence. It's more important to me than a conviction or an acquittal. It's the, did Donald Trump get a fair trial of his peers? I do not want witch hunts, Mm -hmm. if that's what Donald Trump is saying. I do not want curtailments of freedom of speech. I want Donald Trump to get the fairest trial that he can possibly get, despite the fact that on a daily basis he does things and says things that would Want, you know that, that sort of wants you to have gag orders and, <laughs> and do things to him. Um, the pot, bottom line is if a former president of the United States and a prominent person in this country does not get a fair trial, that's bad for all of us. Wow. Now, as the journalist and also as the author, as you write about things that have already happened, how do you keep your foot out of predicting what's up next? <laughs> uh, probably my history of being wrong about everything. Um, I, I'm the worst predictor in the world of everything all the time, which is the great part of being a journalist because now I don't have to be a predictor, right? I actually report the news as it happens in the moment that it happens. And that's really exciting, right? One of the best things about being a journalist is you get the news first and you disseminate it. People yeah. come to trust you for being that source. But I am an absolutely terrible, terrible predictor. The irony is that I most of my career has been, been as a financial journalist. And people ask me advice on the stock market. And I always respond, if I were that, that good, um, I, I wouldn't be on this phone call with you. I'd be on my yacht. <laughs> um, you know, or my helicopter doing something else. So uh, my, my predictive abilities are terrible. Speaking of the stock market, okay, you jumped on that one. What the heck happened yesterday where we lost 400 points? Yeah, it's just, you know, we're in a jumpy market. Keep in mind, it's generally up. So when it's generally up and the, and the, and the Dow is pretty high, 400 points is just a smaller thing than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. I tend to now think about it only in terms of percentage moves. Now, that was a big one. There's no question. But my general rule is wake me up when it's a 3% move one way or the other. Now, if you have 10 days of 1% or 1.5% moves, that's serious mm-hmm. because the average year in the stock market gets you like – seven percent gain or something like that but i wouldn't worry about it we're in this unusual period where we're worried about whether there's going to be inflation and more interest rates we've done a really really amazing job in america fighting inflation much better than europe and the rest of the world has Um, but there's this constant question about whether the fed is done and whether the fed will continue to raise interest rates but keep in mind the overall picture stock market overall way up unemployment way down uh economic growth good corporate profitability good and wages are going up yeah Th- that combination does not typically happen part of the wages thing is a is these labor unions and the strikes that are going on at the moment but in the end and i remind people of this sometimes it takes a long time to make these adjustments if wages are going up it will cause inflation in the short term but if it all works well you end up like norway where wages are high and prices are high and everything ultimately adjusts and people in norway are very very happy as a result but that takes 10 15 years sometimes to get there so you know a blip of uh, a, a few weeks on the stock market if you're a long-term investor i wouldn't care about you know, as that journalist, I know you go seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but the big news today is is that they these businesses, okay, everybody's coming back to work, but they want to work a four-day work week. How does that mess up yeah. the financial world? It doesn't, and that's the funny thing. Adam Grant, who's a, you know, a guy I read a lot from the University of Pennsylvania, he has studied the um, work weeks, shortened work weeks, flexible work weeks, working from home. And the fact is, most evidence is that it affects nobody. Uh, it's it's much better for workers, particularly in a country where we've got long commutes and, and you know, that so much productivity is lost in the time that it takes to get to work and go home. The worker during COVID was actually more productive and more creative. Companies have an issue with this because they've got offices and they have beliefs about creativity and people being together. It's not all bearing out. So I think sometimes companies have to take a less hard line on this thing and say, this is the work I need done. 
if you can get it done in four days or yep. three days or upside down or backwards or wearing your underwear, that's fine. Uh, companies just have a hard time breaking their rules and they, they, they sort of almost see it as a form of insubordination that they want people in here five days a week, nine to five, that's the way work goes. And I think the truth is it's 2023, work is changing. COVID yeah. changed us yeah. and, and I'm, I'm okay with that until I see evidence otherwise. I like being in the office a lot. I like being with my, my, my peeps, yep. but some of my peeps like staying home. And bottom line is they get their work done and we probably just have to have a cultural reevaluation of what work looks like. So what are you doing as a regular person to stay in touch with who your viewer and reader is? I mean, do you do something in the community to where you can look into the eyes of, the, of that person and get to know their life? Oh, all I do is I'm on the road. I mean, even when I covered the war in Ukraine, you know, my one condition was I don't want to be on a balcony like reporters are. Yeah. I'm always on the ground. Um, you know, in the first nights of that war, I was at a train station in Budapest receiving refugees and talking to them, you know, after they got off a 30 hour train ride. In America, I go into little communities and I find a sort of a small mix of people and create my version of a dinner party. Although there's no food, we just sit and talk in a, in a public park or or something like that. I, I think you can never be smart enough. You can never be smarter than your viewer or the people around whom you report. You know, I do a lot of hurricanes and tornadoes and school shootings and things like that. But when I'm not doing that, I'm just out there talking to people, not as if they're an expert guest on my show, not grilling them, not intimidating them, not interrogating them, just sitting there and asking them why they feel the way they do mm -hmm. and trying to develop some empathy for where they are. Not an expert at it by any means, and it's not scientific, but I, I don't believe you can keep on reporting on people and how Americans think and how they feel just by statistics and vote outcomes. You just have to go out there and talk to as many people as you can all the time. I love doing that. Yeah. So great but it, it has to be done oh my god and they've got stories I mean you can get into some they've wacky areas but man they've got stories. Right. And if you understand where they're coming from, then you understand it a little bit. Look, I'm fundamentally a pluralist, right? My view is that the world is better for people with different ideas, who like different foods, who practice different religions. You know, I, I, I like that. I, I grew up in Canada, right? I think that's an amazing thing. I don't think that people with different views challenge my worldview or uh, or affect the way I live or, or see the world. Uh, but I don't. that's not a view every American shares with me. So I also like to get out there and practice what I preach. What does good dialogue look like? What does good conversation look like? What does respectful debate look like? Let me, let me get out there and actually do it with people. And that's part of the book, right? I've written a book. So I've got lots of people who disagree with me about what Donald Trump's capabilities and culpabilities are. And my view is, here's the book. You read it. Let's talk. Yeah. And the book we're talking about is the Trump indictments. How do you keep people from looking at the cover and judging that cover? How do we get them into those pages to see that what you've got here is really fact? Well, I mean, part of it is just the cover design, right? We called yeah. it the Trump indictments, the 91 criminal counts against the former president of the United States. That is a judgment free title. Yeah. Right. It's not not some kind of there are sexier titles. There are better <laughs> ways to, to write a book about the Trump indictments that will make them fly off the shelves. But I want this to be read by everybody. I want everybody to be able to give this to their father-in-law, their brother-in-law, their their uncle at the Thanksgiving table and say, this is just it's just the stuff. It's unabridged. It's unedited. It's all that stuff. The only editing I did was decide the order of uh, the indictments. I didn't put them chronologically because actually um, some of them are just more interesting than others. And, uh, you know, once you get to that Manhattan case, if you started with that one, you might put the book down because yeah. it's it's a lot of technical accounting stuff. Um, but just read them. Read them for yourself. And, and, and if you come to the conclusion that these are weak charges or these are witch hunts or whatever, that is your absolute right. Right. to do that. But don't come to an opinion before you know what's in them. My God, I mean, this this whole entire thing has been, because Donald has been a part of our lives for how many decades? I mean, we he, we've many of yeah. us have grown up with him, and, th and then to see this happening, it's almost like watching Leave it to Beaver, and, and Beaver's in trouble. Well, that's right, but what was really interesting about that Manhattan uh, uh, ruling yesterday was the idea that the creation myth of Donald Trump as this self-made billionaire uh, was destroyed by a judge in Manhattan in a summary judgment. So, see, yesterday was probably the case that was the least important. It's it's not criminal. It's a financial fine that might be $250 million. What, what people missed is a judge ordered the dissolution of all of Donald Trump's companies yesterday. 
Mm. They are all going away. It is punishment. And the judge said, you have been living and working a fraud. So I thought that was really important because the thing that Donald Trump depends upon is people thinking he's this businessman and he's a successful businessman. And a judge yesterday said, no, actually, you're a fraud. So, uh, yeah, that would be like somebody telling you Bieber is a fraud. Um, And that would be hard for some people to comprehend, although some of us watching him in over the last seven or eight years have realize that that's probably what the case is but to hear it from a judge in a court is 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 interesting so why did my heart fill with compassion when they brought up that the sons are involved in this too i mean because all of a sudden i had a different feeling in my heart i don't know that's interesting i I, you know one a lot of people make comparisons to donald trump and the whole you know mob stuff we have a lot of prosecutors to talk about these things, and and it is a concept of family. Now, sometimes in the mob, the family doesn't mean family, blood relatives, but in this particular case, the kids were involved in the way that the business was run, uh, and and by the way, that extended into the presidency, right? Eric Eric wasn't really involved in the presidency. Don Jr. is is Donald Trump's main guy on mm-hmm. social media. Uh, Ivanka Trump got patents while her father was president from China, while he was negotiating with China. um, uh, Jared Kushner got, you know, $2 billion from the uh, Saudis with uh, exactly zero days of investment experience in his life. And the Saudi Investment Committee, the board for the Sovereign Wealth Fund said, no, we shouldn't do this. This guy doesn't have any experience. And he still did it. Now, that's fine. (laughs) You can say that's fine, except that there might have been some quid pro quo there. At least that's the suspicion, because Mohammed bin Salman is not an international pariah. And he should be because he cut up an American citizen who was a critic of his government, and killed him. So, you know, these things, this this family is involved. There's no way around that. They're, they are involved in this thing. Tiffany Trump doesn't seem to be involved in anything uh, to do with these families' activities. But everybody else has got a piece of the action. And if you if you're taking a piece of the action, then you're going to be held account for what happened. Wow. Dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. I love how you, you, you just, I love your research. And one day I would love to watch you research because I know you've just got to get in there and dig, dig, dig. And then you share. That's what we do. I read the internet every day. <laughs> I love it. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. I would really love that. Thank you so much. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.